at the National Convention of the National Farmers Organization in Louisville, Kentucky in December. Many stars from the Grand Old Opry in Nashville, Tennessee were featured. Among them, a young lady whose song hits such as Paper Mansions and Country Girl have made her famous, Dottie West. We'll be visiting with Country Girl Dottie West on this week's show. Also, a visit with Marion White, grain rancher from Shandon, California. So, stay tuned. everybody and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. A year ago last October, the U.S. Farm Report crew on a field trip into the western part of the nation visited on the grain ranch of Marion White. A few weeks ago at National Convention in Louisville, Kentucky, I had the pleasure of becoming reacquainted with this fine NFO member and outstanding rancher. I would like for you now to join with me and watch my interview of Marion White in Louisville, Kentucky. You know, one of our real pleasures was visiting your ranch in October when we were there on the field trip. And uh, I'm sure a lot of our viewers to U.S. Farm Report saw the show that we did at your ranch, but many of them didn't, Marion. So I think that uh, today we ought to just almost act as if we didn't know each other and that we didn't know anything about your ranch operation and just tell the whole story again. Would you mind? Well, our partnership is made up of my brother and I, George, and we go by the partnership name, the White Ranch Company. George has a boy by the name of Ron, and he was the oldest, so he was the first to come home to the ranch. And he's been with us a number of years. Now he's married and lives on the ranch. And he's been very helpful to us in our operation. And if it wasn't for our boys coming back, we certainly wouldn't be so anxious to save the ranch. Well, now, you're producing, of course, cattle, but uh, also a great deal of grain. Yes, our greatest income comes from grain at this time. And we have increased our acreage in grain since the boys have come back into the operation. Mm -hmm. Now, the boys are. Your two sons, Jerry and Ken. That's right. Uh, in uh, in October of 1969. No, I guess it was 68. Well, at least it was a year ago, last October. That's right. When we were there, Jerry, your oldest boy, was in the service. That's right. Ken was there, and we had a, a, a great time with him, talking to him, getting to know him. But they're both back now. That's right. Ken's married, I understand, and uh, so uh, you know, you're you're. The future generations in the White family are, are underway. That's right. Uh, things like this make it possible for me to be here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great education for the boys. They have to take over when I'm not there. Of course, my brother's there, but he's not there at all the time. And, he's, and uh, I think that that's a great help for them to get started in the management, right direction mm -hmm. in management. Yeah. Now, this, this land on which you produce grain is pretty arid, isn't it? This is that's an right. arid part of the country, or as you told me, it's referred to as semi-arid. Yes. But that's a little bit of an exaggeration at times, isn't it? Well, the annual rainfall in Shandon, where I live, is 10 inches, but many times we get a great deal less than that. And last wow. year was a perfect example, example with a six and a half inch rainfall average with uh, a severe frost condition, we don't often have in that particular area, uh, reduced the, most of the area to a below normal crop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, although our ranch was in hill country, we weren't affected near as much from the frost. And with a 
rainfall, six and a half inches, we like to use pounds. We used to use sacks. Now we use pounds in California. We had nearly 2,200 2, pound average. In uh, many of our areas in the surrounding area, uh, 2,000 pounds is our normal. Our particular ranch is near 2,500 pounds is our normal. Mm -hmm. You know, you used to wait for the rainfall, didn't you? That's right. You depended on nature to, to set your, your, your planting and uh, the routine of growing grain. But uh, in the early 60s, you and George decided to take another approach. Would you tell us about that? Well, in 1961, George and I had a very serious discussion on which way to go in our, in our ranch operation. In fact, we even considered selling. When you spend a lifetime in the ranching business, you don't, want, you don't give that up easily. So we, we heard of a different operation in the northern part of the, of the area, around some 50, 60 miles away, about a rancher or farmer was using a fertilizing, what I call a precision type seeding, dropping the fertilizer with the seed and seeding the crop, the grain, prior to the rainfall, mm -hmm. any rainfall. So we started, this man advised us, and we made several trips to see him that year, advised us that if I was you boys, he called us boys, I don't know why, <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would uh, plant 400 acres and see how it goes for you and then increase it. So we were so pleased and we were ready to push the panic button at that time, we came home and planted the whole ranch. And uh, we were quite pleased with the, with the results and we weren't using the same drilling method. We had a different type drill. Mm -hmm. So two years later, we changed to a press wheel drill because it's very important to seed the grain at the proper depth and the press drill helped us to accomplish that. Well now, Marion, in your entire grain operation, everything you do in terms of innovations, uh, equipment uh, improvements, is, uh, is intended to increase speed, isn't it? That's right. To become more efficient. That's true. Now, you know, we hear that uh, efficiency in farming has been kind of a bad thing, but in your case, I think it's been good. Well, Bill, we have, I feel that we have probably gotten efficient before the word got so popular. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, a word that's used a little too much today, that farmers found that they had to get efficient to survive. And we've been getting efficient long time before our specialists were advising us to get to be efficient. Now, wrapped up in all of this efficiency are these many, I call them now, white ranch innovations, because you're doing things that are, are your specialties, that belong to you, that are your exclusivities. For example, let's talk about what you do with a lot of your equipment, Marion. You buy the biggest equipment you can buy, but that's not big enough. So you take the manufactured equipment and you then change it and convert it to your use. Tell us about that. Well, when you're in a hilly terrain, there's certain types of equipment. You're more or less limited to size and depending on areas, what the size of your equipment, but uh, we at the present are pulling 56 feet of press wheel drill, which is made up of four 14 foot drills. Then we must, there, there isn't any di hitch that is, uh, that you could possibly buy from a manufacturer that would fit that type of operation. So it's up to us to design and build a hitch that will uh, make it possible for us to pull that size of a tool. Those hitches have to be hinged and, uh, and so forth, and they have to be strong because we have and build exceptionally uh, great, uh, with a great deal of strength into them because we pull that particular hitch with a 216 horsepower DA tractor. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, when you have a, a tractor of that size, you must be able to handle your seed, the filling of the seed fast. And you must be able to put fertilizer uh, in, the, in your equipment fast. So it takes some specialty equipment to service this type of an operation. Now, with two tractors, and you do have two That's large right. tractors, you have a, a great capability in seeding. How much can you seed? How many acres in a, in a working day, say, of 11 or 12 hours? Well, due to the uh, seeding dry and uh, being such a dusty condition, we don't attempt to work nights in that operation. And we start earlier in the season, in the fall, uh, around the middle of October. 12th is sort of our target date. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work a six-day week, and we probably uh, try to keep work actually a 12-hour day. The tractor probably averaged 11 hours. And these two pieces of equipment would seed 240 acres a day. In fact, that was our average for last year in uh, seeding a total acreage of 4,750 acres. It includes moving and all the yeah. breakdowns and everything. 240 acres a day. That's right. That's covering a lot of territory. Yes, it is. It's quite different from, uh, I remember my dad uh, seeding with the old drill, a 10-foot drill, and uh, thinking he did quite a day's work, mm -hmm. and he so planted 15 acres. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, Marion, uh, a year ago, October, visiting your ranch, we yes. had the pleasure of meeting Ken, your younger son, who uh, was in school at that time at California Polytechnic. Yes. And uh, Ken had designed and built the cab on this, uh, this, what do you call it? I call it a combine. You call it a pusher. Well, it's a sort of a nickname, pusher. It's actually yeah. a, a John Deere 95H combine. Yeah. H means hillside. It's the same combine that's used in level land right. with a leveler on it. But Ken uh, did design the cab and, uh, and build it, right? That's right. Uh, in one of his classes, a mechanics class, in fact, uh, uh, he was working towards a degree in ag to mechanics, mm -hmm. and uh, he was asked to build and design something. So he came to my brother and I, and he, he'd spent a year, a summer or two, eating dust in that harvest. <laughs> so he says, how about building a cab? At that time, we had two machines, and George said, it's fine, but you can't build one. You'll have to build two. So. He went ahead and designed it and built the cab, and we put the air conditioner on. And it had to be a little different than a manufactured cab because all our boys are tall, and they like to be able to stand up in the machine and, mm -hmm. and use some uh, portions of the manufactured design, but the most, the most of it is entirely his idea. Well, now, these young people from California Polytechnic in uh, Ken's classes, uh, they come out to uh, to ranches and farms in the area annually, don't they, uh, Marion? That's right. My father was always a, considered a progressive farmer in the area, and he was very interested in good seed. In fact, we've been a pure seed grower. So naturally, uh, he got acquainted with many university people, and through those uh, associations and acquaintances, we were asked uh, right after World War II if it would be possible if, we, if our ranch could be one of the cooperating ranchers uh, mm -hmm. for uh, uh, field crops division in the California Polytechnic School at uh, San Luis Obispo, which is very close near our area. And those boys or those classes come once a year to our ranch and. We've had as many students as 120 in one class, and they like to see our equipment and uh, our entire operation. We spend near a half a day with them. Do you spend a meal time with them? No, we're able to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> that might put you right out of business. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Speaking of meals, we haven't mentioned your cattle operation. Tell us about that. Well. Due to uh, the situation in agriculture, we uh, changed our operation considerably in, in the recent years. We did have a cow herd, and we found that uh, our, uh, we were losing money. It was costing us more 
to produce a calf, and, and the cost of production was so high, and we could sell him for it. So we changed our operation in, in the early 60s, sold our cows, and went to what we call a, a steer feeder program. And you buy feeder steers in the early part of the season when the rains begin and start, and then you feed them all through on the grass and and uh, fatten them on the grass, and then they're sold to a feedlot. I should back up a little bit. In fact, we buy those steers in the fall and use our stubble, utilize our stubble, and then from the mm -hmm. stubble they go to the grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they're sold as feeders to feedlots to feed out. We've never gotten into the cattle feeding business. We went with that operation a short time, and now we have a, we've changed that. That became uh, so with, with our operation and would be considered quite large in some areas. Uh, we were up to 2,000 head of steers, and uh, we found that our profit margin was so small in, in feeding and buying our own cattle and running them on the ranch, we changed to a by-the-month pasture deal. And we, that has been very satisfactory, and we were on, we we're on that type of program at the present How time. How does that work, Marion? Well, you take these cattle in in the fall on your stubble pasture to utilize the stubble and uh, at a $3 a head per month basis. Uh, and we get a, it's possible for us to get a check every month. That's great. What what kind of capacity do you feel your land will support? How, how many head of cattle can you feed that way? Well, through the stubble season, if we're able to, when we have that type of an operation, a man that has other, uh, a large cattle operation, he can utilize our stubble with a large amount of cattle. So we don't have, our stubble doesn't balance out with our par pasture land. Mm -hmm. So we could use a uh, 2,000 head in the early fall, up until the rains come in December or whatever, whatever time they happen to start, or right. November. Then we go on with a 1,000 head from that time on into in the neighborhood of May and June. Excuse me. You know, a brand new honor has come to you uh, since I saw you last time. In fact, last January, you were elected the state president of NFO for the state of California. So I want to offer you either congratulations or sympathy. Which, which do you think it should be, Marion? Well, it is a <laughs> considerable honor to, I think, to be uh, associated with the NFO and uh, representing the great state of California and being the first president. I, uh, I think it's an honor to be to be in an organization like this that's a producer-oriented organization working together to solve our problems of agriculture. Has it taken a lot of your time? What have been some of your activities as president, Marion? Well, when you come, as a new organization come, comes into a, a state, the first thing is to get acquainted. We spent a great deal of time getting acquainted with our uh, state board of agriculture who happened to the state board director, we call them in California, happened to be a friend of my father's. He was a, started out in the extension service in San Luis Obispo County. So it more or less gave us a, our foot in the door to speak, mm -hmm. to get acquainted. And uh, that's the route we took, was more or less to, to get a NFO acquainted with our, our state people. Yes. What about your state convention? You've had one, haven't you? That's right. Uh, I've never had anything to do with a convention, so it was entirely new to me. Yeah. And putting one on, we, with the help of my board, which I have a very capable bo board of, made up of district presidents over the state, where we have uh, county chapters in California, and we uh, had our convention in Fresno, the very fine facilities at the Fresno Convention Center. Well, Marion, as a grain rancher and as president, state president in California of NFO, surely uh, you have been giving some time to grain marketing through your area. Well, I was uh, working, I've been working, and we've 
finished our second, or working on our second season in the grain and NFO since I've been a member. I am now a county grain chairman in San Luis Obispo County in Monterey County in Central California. And uh, we've had a very active year this year, not so much in production because our production was down, but we're getting our member member cooperation. And we, we're going to a great deal of trouble to keep our members happy with follow-up phone calls and following up sales and payments and so forth. And I think that's the key to this uh, at the local level, to work with these people and maybe hold them by the hand for a little while until you get our program going uh, and they really see how NFO really works mm -hmm. to help us. Mm -hmm. You feel then that uh, in the now that you've had two years under your belt, two seasons, so to speak, that great progress is being made. We have a few members that would take less for the grain to see this organization work. And uh, I feel that we've made great strides in California. Uh, we've got some real people working with us. And Bill Struckmeyer certainly uh, should have a great deal of credit for the effort he's put in and the success in our wet, our grain program and in the entire West. Yeah, isn't he a great fellow? Yes, he is. sure is. One of the nicest fellows I've ever met, and I think a great deal of Bill and his family. Yes. Well, what about the future? And say in terms of membership in California, does it look good? Well, with uh, after the Christmas season being over, we plan an extensive drive for a new membership. We've been working in membership, but not as fast as we would all like. We've, uh, we just recently uh, had a new county come in, and they're very uh, optimistic, Imperial County. In fact, we have uh, quite a, a grain area in that area, and it's a, an import area. It's a big feedlot area, so we're very happy to have them aboard. Marion, we're very happy to have had you aboard once again on U.S. Farm Report. It's always uh, great to see old friends like you, and uh, I never tire of talking to you about the White Ranch. And I want to wish you and George, Ron, Jerry, and Ken, and your, your ladies, wives, and mothers, the very best in the future. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Bill. That discussion with Marion White occurred in a motel near Freedom Hall on the fairgrounds at Louisville, Kentucky. After leaving Marion White, I walked into a room adjacent to the main auditorium in Freedom Hall, where I had this conversation with Dottie West. Dottie, uh, you and the other people from the Grand Ole Opry have been such a delightful addition to uh, the NFO convention. Has it been fun for you? Oh, yes. This has been real fun. They're exactly my kind of people. You know, I'm a farm girl, too. Well, tell us a little bit about your farm background. All right. I was born just out of Nashville, Tennessee, on a farm near McMinnville, Tennessee, which is, I bet you never heard of it. Never did. <laughs> it's a big town, and it's between Nashville and Chattanooga, but... Uh, uh, I learned to drive a tractor before I learned to drive a car, <laughs> and uh, I'm a good driver. Well, I think you were an excellent <laughs> choice for an NFO convention. Incidentally, uh, there was a special reason, wasn't there, why uh, NFO chose you to be the girl singer here? Yes, uh, I understand that it was from a song that I had written about being a country girl, and it's simply called Country Girl. And uh, most songs in the country music field especially are written of uh, the country girl marrying the city boy and it doesn't work out and all that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to um, say the pretty things that I remember of being a country girl because I still long for them. And uh, I plan to go back to the farm someday. I live in Nashville right now, but uh, I plan to move out a little bit. It's still, still sing, but... <laughs> yes. The farm is still the really good life, isn't it? It really is. And, of course, as you know, NFO is trying so arduously to maintain the family independent farm that uh, you sing about and that you remember so well. Well, that's wonderful, and I, I certainly admire them. I really do. I have a lot of respect for the farmers. They're the greatest people in the world. You know, you're in a, in a field, in a category of music that uh, is really coming into its own. I guess that country western music is more popular today than it ever has been, isn't it? Yes, it is. It really has grown, and I think it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons 
for it. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, Chet Atkins and Owen Bradley, who are two great men in Nashville in the recording industry, and I think they changed country music some uh, for the good. They used mm -hmm. string, uh, like violins, we call them fiddles, yeah. and so forth, and made it a prettier sound, easier to listen to, but it's the same songs, and the singers still sing them the same way but they're just done up prettier. Dottie, uh, you don't consider yourself a Western-type singer at all, do you? No, I don't really sing cowboy songs. Uh -huh. I know a couple. I could do a uh, cattle call, maybe, or something yeah. like that, but uh, I sing country songs. Yeah. Now, you record on the RCA label, right. and uh, you have a new album out, don't you, or soon to, yes. to be out? No, I have a brand new one just released, I see. and uh, this is with a country boy. I uh, did duets on a whole album with Jimmy Dean, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of the folks know Jimmy from his shows and yeah. so forth and uh, we're working shows together now we'll be in Las Vegas in February and March so if any of you uh, good farmers would like to bring your green thumbs and your money <laughs> come on out to the landmark we'd love to see you by the way we're uh, in a room just off of the convention floor here at Louisville and you perhaps can hear in the background an address by Orrin Lee Staley who is accepting the presidency again this year he has been elected president of uh, NFO uh, How many Mr. years has he been Oh, president? gosh, I don't know. Some 15, um, quite a did few, I understand, I think or something so. like that? All right. uh, uh, you all have in store for President Staley a nice surprise. Yes. Would you tell our viewers about this? Well, just real quick, like, because we haven't given it to him yet. But uh, tonight at the big show, we plan to give him uh, an award. Or, uh, uh, anyway, this comes from our feelings, from the Country Music Association and, and all the artists at the Grand Ole Opry. We'd just like to have him know that we appreciate him using country music at the convention and that we respect uh, his people. Mm -hmm. Well, country music, uh, I think, should become a part of every NFO convention, and I'm sure that you have had the honor and privilege of being the first of many such shows in the future. Well, I hope to visit with them every year, if it's possible, you know. Uh, it's they're, because they're my kind of people. They really are. I have really enjoyed shaking hands with them and visiting with them backstage because they speak my language, really. And that was Dottie West, who along with Claude King, Stonewall Jackson, Bob Lumen, and others were featured at the National Convention of the National Farmers Organization in Louisville, Kentucky last December. Of country music, Orrin Lee Staley in part says this, I feel there's nothing more appropriate for good country people than the best of country music. Country music is as much a part of rural America as old glory is of our great nation. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this same time on this same station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. <laughs>